discussions that's got to take place. And so um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what God's doing. And uh, at the same time, I feel um, a stirring because we have so many miles to go before we are ready and so little time before we actually get there. Are you with me? Say amen. Uh, everybody says, well, I just can't wait until the new church is built. Well, praise God. And, and I can't either. However, you got to remember the church is the people. That's just brick, mud, and mortar or steel and concrete and all of that. And that's wonderful. That's a place to worship. But we've got to be ready as the church. We are the ecclesia, the call out of God to do ministry. That means I, as a pastor, and our staff has to equip all of our workers. That's why you hear me talking about leadership training, leadership training, because the word in Ephesians says that a pastor's job is to equip the saints of God and prepare them to do works of ministry until Jesus comes. Now, I believe we're living in the last days. Don't get me wrong. I feel like the signs of the times are all around us that, that we are living in the last days. I believe I'll see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But until he comes, I've got to work like he's coming in a million years. I've got to continue to be diligent. I've got to continue to train and lift up people and, and work with people. So I want to encourage you to get on board what God's doing here at the Harbor Worship Center. I'm excited about it. Our groundbreaking ceremony is November the 17th at 11 o'clock in the morning. That's a Saturday. I want to urge you to get your friends, get your neighbors, everybody come together. We ordered a bunch of um, things today. The banners um, uh, that's going to go on the property, the coming soon banner. You get a little preview of that if you check out my Facebook. I posted a, a pic of what that's going to look like. Two of those banners will go up uh, sometime before the groundbreaking declaring that we'll uh, be uh, the Harbor Worship Center coming in June of 2013. We also ordered a bunch of other uh, items uh, that's going to be part of the groundbreaking ceremony. I want you to join me in helping to pump that up to be the largest event that we can. Now, if you read something that I write on Facebook or, or WordPress, Twitter, or whatever, because I normally send something out every week. Uh, my, my thoughts is that if everybody who follows me, if you'll just reshare that, that'll help us get the word out. Now, you may not like what I said and don't want to share it. That's your prerogative. That's all right. I have found out that I'm usually as popular as the last decision I made. And, uh, and the ones that liked it will uh, shout it, and the others won't. They'll frown about it or write something else about it. <laughs> But anyway, that's just part of it, isn't it? That's part of life. So, but I urge you to get excited and be on board with us. We had a wonderful day this past Sunday. Our first service was absolutely packed. The second service left a little to be desired. I think there's 40-some-odd people in the second service, but the first service was actually packed. And um, I mean, I'm sure we could have put a few more, don't get me wrong, but, but it, it looked very good. My goal is to see us packing both of them but by the time the building is built. Um, how many of you will join me in helping with that goal? I might have to turn the lights up and see if y'all are awake. Uh, we need everybody to get on board to help toward that goal. We will have a friend day before too many days. But let me say this before we dismiss our classes. Um, this coming Sunday, missionary evangelist brother Nick McSpadden is going to be with us, and he'll be speaking in all the services on Sunday. I'm looking forward to seeing Brother Nick. He's a great man of God. He is a guy who looked at my son Adam and called him off of the drums one day and right here prophesied to him before he ever touched a piano in church and said, by the grace of God, whatever you lay your hand to play for the glory of the Lord, you will play it skillfully. And uh, that was over ten years ago. And uh, within months after that prophecy, he began to play the piano in the church. Within a year or two, we put him on staff in the church. And he has been here as our music minister ever since. And whatever he puts his hand to do, somehow he does it skillfully, as the Lord said. 
Brother Nick also prophesied about the church and all the things that are taking place. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I also I want to tell you this is a little sneak preview, and you're going to get this just because you came to church on Wednesday night. Dr. Johann Brewer uh, from South Africa is going to be preaching a revival for us in February of this year. I'm excited about it. He is seeing phenomenal results everywhere he goes. And um, uh, you'll have to listen close because of that accent. But nonetheless, uh, I've counted an honor to be able to get involved in his schedule. I talked with him on the telephone yesterday. And uh, I'm looking forward to God doing something phenomenal. Amen. Let me dismiss our classes at this time. God bless you is my prayer. Those of you who remain, I want to talk with you about a very touchy subject tonight. A very touchy subject indeed. Entitled, Dealing with Disappointments. Uh, I had my fair share yesterday. Actually, I posted, how many of you read my blog on on uh, WordPress today. Some of y'all read it. The rest of y'all need to go home and catch up. I, uh, I blogged something, and I believe this to be true. Well, I know it to be true, uh, whether or not everyone agrees with it. Everybody has a right to their own opinion. As a church, we don't promote any candidate uh, from the pulpit. I've had city councilmen. I've had, I've had people in government come to me and ask me, could I? I, I have been accused of even doing so. Uh, we had the sheriff with us some uh, time ago, and uh, people thought that, you know, I got together and tried to garner up some votes, and that was not the case. We don't, we don't push any candidate. We push people to vote on biblical principles. And so my man didn't win yesterday. Uh, I voted for Romney. I don't hate Barack Obama. In fact, uh, I said he's my president. This is my country. I didn't vote for him because, not because of the man, but because of the platform of things that I hold uh, completely against the Word of God. That's just my opinion. I'm not pushing on this. I'm just telling you, this is mycology right here. Okay? That's what I did. But I said, you know, and boy, was I disgusted as results come rolling in. And I was, that's just me. And uh, you're entitled to your opinion if it's different, and, that, and that's okay, and I do respect that. And uh, once o Ohio was called, I said, well, that's it. There's no chance. And I was aggravated. And I understood what it was like to be disappointed. And uh, so I went to bed early. But I got up early. I got up early and we was at the church at 20 minutes till 7, Brother Ray and I. We read the Word of God together and we prayed together. And I called... Barack and Michelle Obama's name and their children's name and Joe Biden's name and his family and the Romneys and the Ryans. And I asked God to bless my president and I asked God to bless my country and I asked God for his wisdom to prevail in Washington and not the agenda of any man, white or black. It doesn't matter. So I wrote a blog that said, while I voted the other way, America has spoken, and uh, while I did not agree, I'm not a rebel. I'm not moving to Canada. I'm not moving to Mexico. I'm going to pray for our leaders. I'm going to believe God for them, and I'm going to be a good American citizen. Amen? And, you know, because I'm quite sure when George Bush won, there was other people disappointed. That's the way it is. But I want to urge the church to join me in praying for our country and for our local leadership. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything to do, but no authority is set up except the authority that God has allowed to be in place. So on God's timeline and on God's timetable, at this point in the game, Barack Obama is supposed to be president here. So we, uh, while you and I may have saw it differently or whatever, you know what I found out? That in the Bible, whether they were serving under King David under King Solomon, or if they were banished to Babylon and was under Nebuchadnezzar or some other foreign king, God was still God. Amen? So, anyway, that's my two cents. So I want to talk with you tonight about disappointment. Dealing 
with disappointment. Notice with me Psalm 42 and 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. I'm going to hope in him, and I'm going to praise him, and I'm going to be lifted up. Why? Because of his countenance. So when it comes to disappointment, much like discouragement, disappointment is one of those things that we have all faced, we've all experienced it, but we don't really know how to wrap it with words. Disappointment is seen on the face of a little boy who was promised by a coach that today is your day. You're going to get in the game. But the score is not looking good. And little Johnny's not quite as good as Billy. And so Johnny has to take his seat on the bench another week. And disappointment comes across his face. Disappointment is in the herd. It's heard in the voice of a little girl who has saved her money all month. Since last month, looking at the toy store and seeing a little doll but when she gets there she finds out that they've sold the last one and they've discontinued the doll and they won't be anymore disappointment shows on her face it is felt in the sobs of a wife who stands in the hospital chapel hearing a doctor say I'm sorry ma'am I really did do all that I could do. Disappointment is tasted in the tears of a man filled with ability, filled with ambition, yet has been turned down time and time again for the job of his dreams because someone a little younger or a little more connected to the system was called for the job. We've all experienced it, and none of us here are immune to the feeling of disappointment. You'll never get so calloused and tough so as not to be affected by it. One is never far removed or isolated so that he cannot be affected by or feel disappointment. Disappointment comes in various ways, but it does come. It causes hurt in varying degrees, but it does hurt. What is disappointment? What are the results of disappointment? And how are we as Christians to deal with disappointment? I've made a few observations that I want to point out to you tonight, if the Lord would help me. First of all, I want to define Disappointment. Everybody's got their own ideas. You know what it felt like when you were disappointed. But let, just listen to this uh, definition and see how it fits. Disappointment is the failure to realize the expectation or hope in something. It is the failure to realize that that you've hoped for, that that you've expected that that you have longed for. When you come to the realization that you're not going to get what you have been waiting for so long, when that will never become a reality, disappointment sets in. It sounds like a formal definition and kind of cold, and it is. So let me give you something that's a little bit more uh, on our level and a little more applicable to our feelings. Just like the word discourage is the opposite of the word courage or encourage. Are you with me? So if discourage is the opposite of courage and disappoint is the opposite of appoint, so then you might say that disappointment is the undoing of an appointment. 
In other words, I had an appointment with destiny. It was supposed to intersect right here. And disappointment is, is the undoing of what was supposed to have happened. Are we on the same page? An appointment is the aligning of your plans. If I made an appointment today to do an interview with the Economic Development Director of Kingsland, he's writing a book and he wanted to interview me, and he said, I, 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 can we do that? I said, yeah, we can do that. When? Well, Tuesday. Well, Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So I have aligned my schedule. He has aligned his schedule, and they are supposed to intersect on Tuesday in the office. Now, there could be something that would crop up on my side or his side where that appointment don't happen, and when you don't get the appointment, then you have the disappointment. Now, that's a little subtle because obviously we both could reschedule those, but when you're looking at something in life that maybe it was your dream job, maybe it was the dream girl, maybe it was the dream guy, Maybe it was the, dr the dream job that you went to school for, that you worked for and believed for. You see, if you make an appointment, uh, then your, your schedule has come together to coincide with that desired event. An appointment is the, the sending forth of plans or the setting down of plans. It, like, for instance, in my iPad right here, I can pull up my Google Calendar and whatever I put in there, all of a sudden, boom, it pops up on my Google Calendar on the telephone. When I go to the desktop um, in the office and I pop up that Google Calendar, lo and behold, it has synchronized all of them. And thank God for that technology because I can't tell you the times that I've double booked things, done things that I, you know, said, oh, yeah, I'm available. I can do that only to find out, you know, when it's too late that I can't do both things and be both places at the same time and somebody gets mad with me and it's my calendar's fault. No, it's not my fault, but before they had them all synced up that way. So an appointment is the sending forth of plans, the, the, of efforts, of organization, that we would see something come to pass. So disappointment comes as a result of the breaking down or the undoing of an appointment, uh, uh, the appointing of your hope, the appointing of your dreams, the appointing of your ambitions and goals, your plans, your energies toward a specific person, place, or goal for the future. I want you to notice the, just a few examples with me. A young lady invests her time, her hopes, her dreams, her money in her wedding day. The day before her wedding that she has planned for, that she has hoped for, that her parents has saved for, that they stood for hours at David's bridal and, and to figure out a dress and they all cried and all of those things and then her fiancé changes his mind on Friday night before the wedding on Saturday. The result is a lot of disappointment. A young couple, maybe they get the news that they're going to have the, the baby that they've tried to have for so long and they decorate their room and they buy the needed furniture for the nursery and they get the, the shower that comes in from the church and everybody lays, or, 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 or ladens them down with all kind of uh, goodies for the baby and they painted the nursery and they bought all of the stuff and friends bought it and they have an appointment in nine months, you know, and somehow, somewhere, some way, a sudden miscarriage takes place and they are crushed. Disappointment beyond belief. Maybe it's a mom and a dad that for 16 years have poured every available dollar into a coffee can or an IRA and they were planning and saving and hoping and dreaming that this smart brain child that they've raised will go to Harvard or maybe Georgia or Georgia Tech or whatever and pretty soon, you know, they're hoping, they're dreaming, they're desiring. Their kid has all of the ambition. He's taken the SAT and just blew it out of the water. I mean, he's taken all kind of things and man he is at the top of his class and could go to school where he wants to go to school but all of a sudden he's introduced to drugs begins to abuse them and his scholarships went away and mom and daddy's hopes and dreams went away 
disappointment, the undoing of plans and expectations and time and energy and effort that has been poured into something and dreams. This thing was supposed to intersect for 16 years and now look at it. It's gone. And mom and dad sat weeping and sobbing and asking themselves, what did we do wrong that our boy has turned out like this? Disappointment. No one is immune to it. So now, so that is the definition. I hope you understand that I, I, I've, I've showed you disappointment. Now, I want us to, to detect tonight. We'd all be detectives. Brother James will help you for a moment. That We'll just look around and see if we can detect some disappointment. Can, can I tell you, I have learned in pastoring that people are good. Man, it ought to be Halloween every Sunday because people come to church with masks on. Felt that one, man. Y'all with me? Wearing masks all the time. You know? So, uh, listen. First of all, I want us to look at three major areas where I think that we can detect disappointment. See, nobody's immune to it. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not immune to it. Look back and say, you're not either. First of all, I want us to talk about disappointment in others. Without looking around, just think about it. How many times has he or she, them, they, let you down? They're always saying they're going to do this, and they always talk a big game, and they don't never come through. Keep looking straight ahead. Huh? Never come through. As a pastor, they're going to do this and they're going to do that. They don't never come through as members. They're going to do this, they're going to do that. Don't never come through. People are going to be people. Lord, don't I know that. Hello? So disappointment with others. In other words, you've been disappointed by someone. You've been disappointed by your friend. You've been disappointed by a relative. You've been disappointed and disillusioned by an employee or an employer. Maybe it's a spiritual leader and you found out that they were human. Maybe it's a politician or a political personality. Maybe even it's a hero that you found out was doing steroids when he hit the home run. Look at all of these kinds of disappointments. But Paul had some disappointments to deal with too. He was disappointed in some other people too. Some of, sometimes we feel like all oh, those Bible characters, man, he wrote all that stuff that my God's going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And Paul would write and say to the Philippians in 4 and 13, but I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. And we look at him as this great general for God all the time, but he suffered disappointment too. Let me show you. In Acts 15, 36 through 39, we're going to find that Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word uh, and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take him with them because he had departed from Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then there was a contention between, uh, became so sharp that they parted from one another and Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus and, you know, um, so this, this dispute caused Paul and Barnabas to break apart, and Barnabas and Mark go, and Paul and Silas go. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Um, Mark had walked out on a previous assignment, but Barnabas was adamant about forgiving him and giving him another chance. And these two great men of God, I know y'all thought Bible characters never argued, you know, Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas, man, they could never have a cross word. No, they had board meetings too. They sat down and they were discussing a missionary journey. And one of them said, I, I, I want to take Mark with us. And Paul said, you can't take Mark. Why? He walked out of some Pamphylia last time. He's not going. He said, well, I think we ought to take him. Well, no, we're not going to take him. And there was such a sharp contention between them that the two great men of God, Paul and Barnabas, decided that they would just separate. They'd still do both. Both would do church ministry. And this ain't the only time. Paul and Peter had such a, uh, a dispute, too. Man, man, I'm so now I see where it's all coming from. Paul said to the Galatians, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. See, Paul's disappointment can be heard in this letter. He had worked hard to mature them, only to see them fall back into legalism. 
It sickens me when I have worked hard to, to mature somebody in the Lord, to bring them along this Christian way, and then to see them fall back or become so spiritually minded they're no earthly good, or to fall into legalism. In that day, legalism was, well, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you must do this, you must do that. And we understand that there are certain rules. But the church was known for years and years and years and we drove off hundreds and thousands of people because we could tell everybody what we did not believe in and could tell nobody what we did believe in. Oh yeah, we believe in Jesus, but, but that's about as far as it was. People say we were saved by, by Jesus, but they couldn't tell you the 14 articles of faith for nothing in the church of God, but they could tell you what we're against. Huh? We don't cuss, dip, and chew, or run with people who do. And... uh you know, we don't do this and we don't do that and you can't do this and you can't do that. And I understand there's got to be some standards. I'm just saying, friend, we majored in the minors so long. We failed to, uh, anyway, let me go on. We need to be able to reach people and share the gospel with them. And, you know, I think we need to turn things and see the opposite side of it sometimes. Let me go on. Second Timothy 4 and 10. Paul says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he has departed for Thessalonica, um, uh, Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. Paul shows us here that we can be disappointed in other people when they do not produce what we had hoped they would produce. I can't tell you in my lifetime, in my 26 years of ministry, how many times I had hoped that this one or that one or the other had matured more, had grown in the Lord more, would trust God more. I can't tell you the times people said to me, Pastor, God has sent me here. God is going to use me, and I know it's going to be tough, and I can't tell you the times I saw them walk away. I can't tell you, I mean, there's been a few times I had wonderful friends that worked with me. I've had times where I had to let people go. They loved God. They loved me as a friend. It hurt me to let them go. But they so disappointed the Lord. Not me. I mean, it did disappoint me, but certain things you just have to let them go for. You'd be amazed. I pastored the greatest church in South Georgia. I fired somebody one time for adultery. I had a member get mad at me. Y'all with me? Why can't we just let it go? Why can't we just forgive? We do forgive. We do let it go. But we don't go on in pulpit ministry as if nothing happened. Are y'all with me? We can't do that. If we're going to do that, we just have to throw the whole word out. If nothing matters, it's just come on down. Let's just do what we want to do. That's not a church. That's a country club. Get a little quiet in here, Lord. So Jesus had hoped his disciples would pray in the garden, but they disappointed him three times by sleeping. Jesus had carried them to the Mount of Transfiguration to show them the actual glory of God where Jesus himself would become, uh, his body would, would, uh, would literally be transfigured before them. A metamorphosis would take place and he would literally gleam with the glory of God Almighty and God's voice would be heard and guess what? He had hoped they would stay awake, but they fell asleep. Huh? I'll never forget, I had a pastor, my pastor, Ray Dawson. He was preaching revival for me in Claxton, Georgia. And I had a guy, probably early 30s. I don't know if he just worked like a dog all week or if he had a sleeping disorder. But man, it wouldn't be five minutes into the message. And nobody wanted to wake him up. Nobody wanted to say anything. It distracted me so bad. And I, I just can't deal with it. Right? Well, lo and behold, I thought I had it under wraps. Pastor Dawson came that morning. Man, he got ready to preach. Y'all know Pastor Dawson. He's crazy anyway. And man, he's preaching and all of <laughs> And man, I saw him when he grabbed the pulpit. And I said, Lord, what's about to happen here? He said, would somebody please wake him up? 
And he says, sir, please set up in church or go find somewhere else to go to sleep. Whoo! Praise God. Now, I, you know, that's just... He was disappointed. You, you study and you prepare to come to church for revival. You pour your heart and soul into a message. And I believe I'd have more, more respect for the man of God. I'd just go find somewhere and go to sleep. Y'all with me? Anyway, now I understand that there are some messages that invite sleep. I understand that. But Pastor Dawson hadn't preached one. I know him well enough to know when he got ready to preach, buddy, there was something worth listening to. Now, I'm going to move on from that before I get in. Anyway, see, uh, he had also hoped that Jerusalem would receive him. Jesus had hoped that Jerusalem would receive him and hear him. But they didn't. Hear him as he weeps. The Bible says that he looked over the city and he wept over the city. He had hoped that the city would hear him, but the city did not hear him. He had hoped that they would embrace him, but they did not embrace him. In fact, they crucified him. So, old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what shall I do unto thee? So then there's, so, so I believe we've detected that there, there is disappointment in others. Isn't that right? Hadn't you looked around and you've been disappointed in somebody? Y'all, y'all I'll just use me. Y'all been disappointed in me sometime, probably. Yeah. I've been disappointed in y'all, too, sometimes. Let's just be honest with each other, right? Been disappointed sometimes. There's been times I knew we could do better. There's been times I knew we should be in the house of God, but we weren't. There's, you know, let me just move on. I need to uh, stick with my outline here. But disappointed in others. And then there's been times I've been disappointed in myself. Huh? Y'all ever done that? Disappointed in myself. About a week and a half ago, I flat, cold, stone, missed a four-point buck. I mean, missed him clean out from here to the center of the parking lot. I could have hit him with a Frisbee. I was disappointed in myself. I knew I shouldn't have told Glenn Warner. I knew I shouldn't have because he ragged me to death. That's just how, but I was disappointed in myself. You know why? Because I've done it I don't know how many times. I've coached other people about being calm. Something about them antlers hitting the trees and clacka lang 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 and all that stuff. And boop, 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 boop. Y'all ain't never experienced that, huh? Come on. Well, you understand what I'm talking about. I'm just saying you're disappointed in yourself. There's been times when I went to preach and I knew I should have done better and I was disappointed in myself. You ever been disappointed in yourself? So we're talking about disappointment, so let's just be honest with you. You see, there's hardly anything more difficult in life to deal with than when you are disappointed when you're with yourself. When you know it ain't nobody else's fault. Here's what I got a problem with. <laughs> I got a problem with people that won't admit that you were the problem. Huh? You ever seen a football player that, that when he missed the ball, he just, he just said, that was me, that was on me. I just cold out dropped it. The quarterback hit me right in the hands and I flat dropped it. I can respect that. When somebody just says that was me, that was my bad. But when everybody wants to blame it on everybody else, you can't grow like that. You can't grow like that. David was disappointed with himself when he realized he had fell into sin. And I tell you something, sin is oftentimes blind. Pleasure is oftentimes blind. A lot of times we do things, we, we, we done slipped into it, way into it, and then we, we don't even realize it until we're confronted with it or even disciplined because of it. And then all of a sudden the veil is rent and we say, Oh my goodness, look how far I am out here and I'm naked. You see. So... Judas was disappointed in himself when he sinned. Peter was disappointed in himself when he realized his sin. Thomas was disappointed in himself when he finally realized and he said, Oh, my Lord, you are my Lord and you are my God. See, it's difficult to come to grips with the fact that you are not what God wants you to be. I have not yet reached that for which I was apprehended for. That's what Paul said. He said, but I daily press toward the mark of the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. I forget those things which are behind me and I reach forward to those things which are ahead of me. Listen, you can't do nothing about yesterday. I can't fix the fact 
Did I miss that four point? He's still running through Woodbine somewhere. Huh? I can't fix that, but I did get the hug the other day. Praise God. You hearing me? You see, you got to, it's not that you failed, it's that you quit trying. When you give up and never try again, then you are toast. You are done. Listen, it's okay to be disappointed in yourself. Learn by it. If you weren't disappointed in yourself, you would accept that and become what they say is status quo. So you're happy to have 20 people on Wednesday night. And I've seen pastors, that they, they don't care no more. They don't care no more. They're happy to run 75 as long as they can pay the bills and draw a salary. It don't make no difference to them who's lost, dying, going to hell. I don't buy into that. I take personal responsibility. If I fill out a report and our numbers are way down, our finances are way down, I take responsibility for it because I'm here to see that we grow, see that we go forward to cast a vision and to bring people along. If I can't do that, i got to go. You all with me? That's just how it is. And uh, But some folks are, if you get to a point where status quo is okay, you're never disappointed with anything. Everything's all right. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. It'd be all right. So some endure what is called a midlife crisis because they are disappointed in the fact that they are no further down the road in life and it's as late as it is. Y'all hear me? That I'm no further down the road than I am and this much of my life has passed by. Let me tell you something. If you're 45 or, or older in here, now, now if you're even much older than that, it's even scarier. But listen to this. When you look around and you say, man, in 20 years, I'm going to be 65. 65, and I'm thinking turn 46. I'll be 66. And for those of you already 65, you say, oh, my goodness, what does that make me? <laughs> well, I will say this. Caleb was 85. I was reading just the other morning, and he said, I'm as strong in God today as I was when I was 45. He said, I'm believing God. I've still got the same faith in God. I, I, he said, you know what? I know God is just as able, and if God will touch me, I'll do just as much now as I did back then. He's strong in faith. Man, I need to move on. I don't even know what time it is. Wow. Uh, so, listen. Um, maybe you've been raised in a success driven society that says you're supposed to be happier than you are, you're supposed to be richer than you are, you're supposed to be healthier than you are, you're supposed to live in a better place, you're supposed to drive a better car. And listen, uh, if you continue to live by that philosophy where nothing's never good enough, you're going to be a miserable person. You are. You're going to be a miserable person. You know what? My Suburban just turned 280,000 miles and I'm happy to drive it. Thank you. I don't want the payment of a brand new one or even a two-year-old one. Are you with me? I know there'll come a time and I've got to do something about it. I'm not in denial. I'm saying as long as i got some mechanical skills, I've had it 10 years and I'll just roll on a little bit longer. Y'all with me? So what I drive don't mean who, it has nothing to do with who I am. Thank God. Right? If you've ever been in the green car, <laughs> you understand. So, uh... <laughs> So who, what I drive has nothing to do with who I am. You are not defined by where you live or what you have or the toys you have or have not. This church, that, this building that we're in is in terrible uh, shape structurally. And, and, and though we are marked by it right now, it don't say anything or define who we are as a church. Are you hearing me? Lord have mercy. I need to, I need to move on. i got a lot of ground to cover. Your kids are supposed to be smarter, you say, and uh, you're supposed to be getting more from life than you're getting. So you get disappointed within yourself. Okay, so we looked at two things. Here's the detection that we detected that we get disappointed in other people, and we know that. I also look in the mirror and realize I get disappointed with myself, and we know that. And then you got another group of people that get disappointed with God. This is a dangerous group. Maybe you would never admit it, but some of you are disappointed with God. Even the election last night. God, how did you allow this to happen? Huh? 
Oh, I've seen Canada lose a football game. I asked God about that. How in the world you? God ain't concerned about that. Y'all with me? Now, hey, I know I've had some good times. And, you know, I, but, but, you know, I don't really think he cares because uh, when we was at Lounge last week, uh, Wayne Hughes, Pastor's Abundant Life Church of God, he loves God with all of his heart and got a bunch of his church out there and his boys graduated from Lounge and they're pulling for Lounge and he's texting me and I wanted to say some bad things. I didn't. I was real nice. <laughs> Y'all with me? So what I'm saying is, you know, they're, they love God and we love God and so what does God do in heaven? Does he flip a coin and say, well, Camden wins tonight? No. So, but many are disappointed with God. They, you know, they, they say things like, it wasn't supposed to turn out this way. So God is at fault. Why did I get this bad report from the doctor? It is God's fault. Why did my child experiment and finally get involved in drugs? What about the accident that took their life? What about this? And, and, and we fault God and we're disappointed with God because of it. God didn't answer a prayer the way you wanted it answered. And it's disappointed you. And you come to the place like the men on the road to Emmaus who became disappointed with the Nazarene who claimed to be so great, whose dreams had died in a borrowed tomb. But what they did not realize, he would not stay. Well, they, he saw him afterwards, actually. But in their minds prior to that, his dreams had died. They didn't realize they were actually talking to the Master. So now, uh, so now we talked about um, the definition of disappointment and how we detect it. It's in, we detect it in others, in ourselves, and then we're disappointed with God. And, um, but uh, now, how are we going to deal with it? Since we know what di disappointment is, and you know you've been disappointed with me or others, you know you've been disappointed with yourself, and we know sometimes we've been disappointed with God, how are we going to deal with it? I'm glad you asked. There are several key principles that we've got to understand whether you're disappointed with God, yourself, or someone else. Understand this, that everything doesn't work according to your agenda. Nor mine. That, uh, and believe me, I've been disappointed a lot of times in life too. And I understand that everything don't work according to my agenda. I pulled most of the hair that I had out working with the bank this past year and a half. Uh, but your disappointment, listen to me, stems because others are not dealing with a circumstance or a situation the way you would deal with it if you were in charge. You don't know how many people could do a better job pastoring the church. I should be able to tell you. I've had a handful tell me over the years. Thank God, not all at one time. But Isaiah 55 and 8, he tells us that my thoughts are not your thoughts. God's agenda, or necessarily your agenda, is not necessarily God's agenda. Are you with me? Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that, that this is Exodus 13 and 17, that God did not lead them by the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their mind and they see war and return to Egypt. In other words, we have evidence right here that God sometimes leads you through harder places because he knew if he led you this particular way, you would get derailed and sidetracked and backslide. So he says, I'm going to take you on a harder path. How many of you know hard times make you pray? Hmm, man, don't we know. Sometimes I'm thinking, Lord, I promise I'll pray. Huh? I promise I'll pray. Just lighten up a little bit, right? So everyone has their own method of doing things. Everyone's entitled their opinion. But God has set up authority in the country, in the state, in the church. Um, he has set it up. And we get disappointed when you can't sell somebody else on doing something your way. Huh? I love Brother Wayne Horn to death. I was out to see him today. I don't think he's here tonight. But I'll tell him anyway because he knows I'm going to tell him. But you ain't going to tell him nothing about frying no fish. Huh? You ain't going to tell him because he knows everything about frying a fish. 
And uh, I was with him one night, man. We caught a bunch of fish, and we've been working on this thing. And, man, he's of the opinion, you know, we're talking about saltwater fish. He said, you can't salt a saltwater fish too much. Man got the box open. I'm not talking about the sprinkle side. I'm talking about the portal. Cooler full of fish. My goodness, I could surf on the salt. I said, Brother Wayne, you got too much salt on there. And, oh, man, you can't salt them. You, 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 can't, you can't put too much salt on them. So, so you ain't going to tell them that about cooking. You ain't going to tell them that about mechanical things. Sister Dolores just said, he don't know nothing. Anyway, <laughs> he's a great man. I remember telling him, because we worked on so many cars together back when he was stronger. And, uh, man, the Lord allowed me one night to figure out a way to do something in a new way. And I learned that you could teach an old dog a new trick. And man, I, I had to say, hey, just give me five minutes and let me show you. And boy, I showed, and I don't never let him forget it to this day. That I didn't have to take off all them parts to get to that. <laughs> He's a great friend, but you see, we want to do things our way. Isn't that right? Isn't that human nature? Because you done figured out what works for you. I have found out this, though, that sometimes if I just back off, Somebody might have a better idea. Somebody might have a better idea. So, anyway, uh, you get disappointed when you can't sell it your own way. Everyone's got their own unique vantage point. So how you see something and how I see something is different. You're not going to see it the same way. Uh, and you know what I have found? The more we collaborate, the more we come together and hear differing opinions, that don't mean we're gonna, we can't obviously do them all. Are you with me? Always remember this, that God's vantage point is much better and higher than both of ours. How many of you know, I can tell you this, as a skydiver, you can see a whole lot more from an airplane than you can see from a car. Huh? That's what the Lord says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are above your ways and past finding out. Lord, let me try to tie this up. So here's some keys to overcoming disappointment. Listen to me. Here, and then if you're a note taker, here it is. Here's the keys to overcoming disappointment. Disappointments, understand this. Disappointments are only delays. If you stay at it. In other words, I, I was telling Brother Larry earlier this, morning, or earlier this evening that I won't ever forget when the bank called me. Our business lender was out of town. I had already told you we're breaking ground, and, and, and that promise got broke. And I said, we're, we're breaking the ground this time, and that promise got broke. The loans have been approved. What's the hold up? I'm talking to them. I told the banker, I said, you guys are making me look like the biggest liar ever walked. I'm tired of telling. In fact, I wouldn't even tell y'all the last time they said. He said, well, you ain't shared it with the congregation. I said, no, I ain't shared it with the congregation yet. I said, how many times have you told me and then come back and said, we got a little wrinkle? I'm talking about wrinkles, man. I'm having wrinkles after all this, right? But anyway, nonetheless. Uh, but um, talking about disappointment, uh, finally our business lender's out of town. It's Brother Garner's last day in office is on Monday. The banker's out of town this whole week. All we got is Monday. It's the last day that the, that the overseer's in town. Last day. I'm thinking, Lord, all of it's hung right here on this one Monday. On uh, Wednesday, the president of the bank calls me and says, Pastor, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He, well, I know the loan's been approved, but he said, you know, um, the appraisal come in a little low. Since, you know, all you want to set up is the, the 8.6 acres where the main camp is at, and you don't want to put the rest of that land in. That's right. He said, well, the appraisal come in about 1.6 some odd million dollars. The problem is you want to borrow about 1.5 something, and the bank only loans 80% of what the appraised value, so you're about $200,000 short. My chin hit the floor. I said, hey, w w wait a minute. You're telling me we got to come up with $200,000? Pretty much that's what I'm telling you. And man, did disappointment hit me. Y'all hear me? Oh, you all ain't never seen me like this. I was, me and Jesus had a heart-to-heart -heart over in the office. And then God sent Kelly to come talk to me. <laughs> uh, did God ever send your wife to come try to straighten you up? Anyway, nonetheless, I, I, I can't see no way. I, 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 I'm just totally blown away. And I remember telling Kelly, I said, you know what, if we don't build this church, I've led the church for the last five years toward this project. It's a lie. 
I'm a lie, and every man ever stood in the pulpit and prophesied all that is a lie. If God don't see this thing, then what? You know, I mean, I'm out there. Yeah, I know y'all ain't ever talked like that. I know you haven't. But I'm flesh and human still. I know y'all have a right. But anyway, I had a heart to heart with God. I said, $200,000. That's a lot of money. Huh? I said, Lord, what are we going to do? I called Brother Garner. Man, this joker is so, he, he was the former, he's still the overseer. He said, well, uh, Brother Michael, it's good to hear from you. What's, what's, what's going on? I said, i got a major problem. He said, well, tell me about it. I tell him about it. And, and you know, he said, well, don't worry about it. He said, we're going to get it worked out. So calm. I said, how can you be so calm? He said, because it's going to work out. I said, you seem awful confident because your last day is Monday. I'm staying here. <laughs> huh? I said, uh, he said, but I assure you, we're going to get it worked out. He said, I want you to get all your stuff and be in Tifton on Monday. At my office at 10 o'clock. I said, okay. I said, but Brother Garner, before you go, let me tell you something. I said, there ain't but three solutions. I said, somebody comes up with $200,000. The bank breaks their own rules and loans an awful lot more money than their bylaws say they can. Or the builder knocks $200,000 off of it. I don't see a great chance of none of those things happening. He said, just be in Tifton at 10 o'clock Monday morning, and we're going to get this worked out. I said, are you sure? He said, I promise you we're going to get it worked out. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know. I'm going to tell you something. I, all week, I told Kelly, I said, overseer's either, he's a genius or he's nuts. That's all I know. I said, because I don't know how. And you know what? So he said, well, brother, would you be willing to put the, the extra land back into the project so we can appraise that? I said, well, at this point, I, I don't have a whole lot of choice. I said, but I don't want to do that. Well, the bank president said to me, he said, well, he said, what if we write into the contract that if you want to redeem five acres, ten acres, or all of it, as long as you pay the appraised value right then of that money, you could pull it out. I said, if you put that in writing, I'll agree to that. What do we got to do? Got to appraise it again. Then they say, well, you know what? That's on the back end. The corner's the real valuable part. So the appraisal come in real low. Still way short. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So we sit in a conference room. Somehow the overseer gets them to chisel $54,000 off of the site work. How he pulled that rabbit out of the hat, I don't know. But nonetheless, I was praising God. We found $50,000, and 10 minutes later, he called back and said, I found $4,000. I said, man, let's keep him on the phone. <laughs> right? What I'm saying is that somehow, some way, the bank bent their rules some. They found some money. We made some adjustments, and it all worked out to where we closed that loan just a few weeks ago. What I'm saying is I was so disappointed in the fact that this it, listen here's the point I was making disappointments are delays and nothing more if God's got you on a prophetic line a disappointment is just a delay if you stay at it somehow it's going to work out you say well I've been working on my master's degree for all these years well it took me eight y'all with me I couldn't resign the church and go let me say this Disappointments are only delays. Whoever said the setback was final? The devil talked you into believing that lie? If, you, if it's final, it's because you allow it to be final. We uh, uh, can't enjoy today worried about tomorrow. Let me say this. Here's what we can do. We can readjust. We can anticipate greater things. We can believe what we've said all these. We can walk our talk, Right? We can say that God is greater and that God is on the throne. Disappointments are good teachers. So grab hold to the lesson that God's trying to teach you. I'm going to tell you something. When the time comes and we build the senior living facility and various other projects that God's going to do over the years, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be a piece of cake because, man, I've learned me some lessons in the last two years. Y'all with me? Disappointments. Are time adjust, or times of adjustment, opportunities to get out of the rut and the same old routine. Listen, you know what? You got to do something different to get something different. I'm gonna say it again. You got to do something different to get something different. Isn't that right? 
If you pour grits into boiling water every morning, you're going to get grits. Y'all hear me? You're going to have to put something else in there if you want to get something else out. Disappointments are merely obstacles. Since the days of the fall of man, obstacles have been in our way. Disappointments, listen, and I'm going to tie this up right here. Disappointments are indicators. Problems that are ahead. You need a change in your priorities. Your reaction to disappointments indicates where you are with God. How you react to those disappointments indicate where you are with God. Listen, disappointments are necessary. For you to be totally developed, differences, uh, different experiences must come your way. Disappointments teach you that every problem, every problem, every problem has a solution. Are you hearing me? The greatest test of your character is what will it take to get you to quit? That's the greatest test of your character. What, what does it take to get you to quit? Every problem does, has a solu- does have a solution. Stand with me if you will and we'll tie it up right here. To deal with disappointments, this is what you've got to do. You've got to make things right with others. According to Matthew 18 and 15, Matthew 18 and 15, I don't know if it's going to pop up there or not, but you've got to make things right with others. You've got to make, you know, if your brother sins against you, go tell him what is between you and him alone. For if he hears you, you've gained a brother. But if not, you hear you, take some witness with you. You've got to get it right with others. Then you've got to get it right with yourself. You've got to get things right with God. I tell you, more often than not, people get messed up because they have lost their communication with God. When you lose your communication with God, you don't talk to others the way you ought to. That, that relationship goes south. So listen, trust is time. Listen, trust His timing. That's what Brother Garner was trying to tell me. Man, I can't tell you times I had conversation with him. <laughs> I, had, I, I talked to him yesterday. <laughs> but uh, trust God's timing. Being aware that your times and your calendar is not His time and His calendar. Trust in God's sovereignty. Be aware that your times are in His hand. Finally, trust His purpose for your life, knowing that the trying of your faith is more precious than gold. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for tonight we've learned how to deal with disappointment. Every one of us here has been disappointed with other people. We've been We've been disappointed with ourselves. Some of us have been disappointed with you, God. I pray that you forgive us of our disappointment. Help us with our disappointment with others and with ourselves, and most importantly with you. I pray, God, that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could be seated for just a moment, my wife is coming to preach. No, I'm only teasing. Uh, No, no, no. Uh, come, she wants to talk with you for just a moment uh, about some shirts. Let me give you a little bit of heads up. We ordered a lot of stuff today. Uh, no, no, you're going to get to talk. We ordered a lot of stuff today. She's just chomping at the bit to get the microphone. She loves the pulpit. Just <laughs> I'll leave the Bible right here. For, but anyway, there's a lot that's going on, and, and she wants to talk with you about the shirts. It would be wonderful if every one of us could be wearing the same thing, uh, or at least the same color, not actually the same shirt. That'd be a big old shirt. Let me, but anyway, let me just get out of here. Kelly, talk to you, and then she'll dismiss you in prayer, I guess. I will? Okay, I'll call Okay. <laughs> okay, November 17th, groundbreaking, 11 o'clock. Okay, we thought it'd be a good idea if everybody that would, I mean, you don't have to, I'm not going to put a gun to your head and say you got to do it, but anyway, for anybody that wants to purchase a t-shirt to wear that day, I'm going to be taking orders out in the foyer. You don't have to pay tonight if you don't want to. You can pay Sunday or you can pay when they come in. It really don't matter to me. But we just need to get them ordered. Anyway, so if you'll see me. And also out there, and this don't have to be done anytime soon. I'll be taking the jacket 
and the little fleece jackets also. I have a sample of them on the table. If you want to order one of those, that's fine, but that will be going on for two or three weeks, and then we'll order those. But anyway, so if you want to have the T-shirts, just meet me out there. And also, Sister Kim will be getting with the ladies probably Sunday about the food. We're going to have a little bit of finger food that day out there, and we're going to have tents set up and all kind of good stuff happening and some free stuff that we're giving everybody. So anyway, if you want a T-shirt, see me out there. Thanks. And if Brother Aaron will dismiss us in prayer.